Hey everyone, welcome to the new trust economy. I'm Tracy Hazard. And I'm Monica Profit. And today we're gonna talk keys, public keys, private keys. I think it's a big question we get, like how are keys any different than passwords and what's the difference between a public and a private? And I really thought this was a great question for you to take on from an education standpoint because of course you wrote the book, Blockchain 101. So oh, I know you can explain this to me and yeah. so that I can explain it to other people. Okay, well, let's see. Um, hopefully we can cut out the middleman and you and I can just both explain this together so that people don't have to come back to you and you have to recap what we've recorded. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there you go. Oh, technology. We'll just send um, them straight to the podcast. Here. here we go. Here's a link for, there's an app for that. And there's yeah. a link for that. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, when there's, there's keys, it's funny because people think there's a password. That's just what I tell this, you know, entity who I am, prove that I know that I'm, I'm like good to get in there. And um, that's how it's usually been for people with centralized systems. But now we've got with a decentralized system, there's kind of another layer of it. And then there's a need for a public ledger or a way to find something by a, a key that's public. So you can go and say, I'm going to search for this kind of transaction or evidence of a thing publicly, but I'm not going to be able to have ownership of that unless I own the private key that proves that that thing that you publicly see belongs to me. So, so is it kind of like a routing number and an account number? So like if you think about oh, it from like a bank? A great, that's a really great analogy, except that, yeah, the routing number really only tells you about the financial institution. But so it so would only tell you about me. Like, well, yeah. I mean, in this case, the routing number ends up being a little bit more like the identifying number of a transaction. But the, the, the account number is the, like your password that's number, me. right? To say that that transaction was my transaction and I can prove it. Ah, so, so you've so got it's a transaction like routing reversing number it. <laughs> and you've got a personal. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So um, using a private key is, is, I mean, of course, it's like the most secure way to make sure that you have this access to say and prove on this digital ledger, this external ledger that's totally broad proof and distributed that, hey, that was actually mine, right? So now there's this way to, to take something that everybody knows about and, and identify it as yours. Um, and that is a really wonderful thing to use this like highly encrypted long string of, you know, numer alphanumerical, yada, 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 this and that. But the problem there is, again, what I think that we face with all new technology is, you know, the, the nerds that, you know, we pretty much, I hate to break it to you, Tracy, but we're nerds. We're, we're nerds. like, we're interested in this stuff, right? We get in this side of it. But the average consumer is going like, how does it, it does, I don't care how it works. What does it do for me? And I, is it easy? Right? So it's we've like, gone from like, that's just a longer to, password. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. And I could never memorize that. And I didn't pick it. And I can't change it. And that's dumb. And so I think that there is still a lot of interface issues that are coming up that we could, that I think more and more innovative companies are going to address to make this easier and more consumable without derailing um, all of the amazing innovation that has brought us to private keys that gives people this incredible privacy and this incredible fraud proof ability to not really have anyone hack your password or hack your private key. Can't really happen. So... Well, see, and that's the part that starts to fall apart, I think, for most people. It's like, it's like it can't happen, but it can. Um, I mean, I, I think that the important things that we probably should really point out for people is that, you know, thinking about it this way, where if all of our account information, as we were using that bank analogy, all of the accounts or all of the banks are located within that routing number, like hackers know where to go right? Because they're like siloing it and they're saying, this is the, you know, the account numbers are here. That's why we're protecting it, right? So obviously the distributed ledger and the distributed information of the blockchain is creating that. So you're not really sure, am I getting access to something that's just stupid or am I getting access to something that's valuable? Hackers don't know that. So there's some protection in that. Well, that's interesting because actually, I think when you look at a private, at a public key for something, you can see transactions that are made between entities. You just don't know what those entities are, who they are. And so by not knowing who those entities are, and certainly not having the private keys to be able to access and say, claim those, claim those transactions as your own, then you can, you can see there's value there, but you can also know that there's no way to really get in to, to hack that value through the system itself. Now you could maybe um, break into someone's apartment and get their private keys and steal them. And through human error and human interaction in the real world, you could get in. But the technology itself has locked that down. So you couldn't sit on your computer in, you know, in Russia and just sit there and hack and hack and hack and hack and hack to get someone's private key. It doesn't work that way. 
you're going to have to break into their home and find what they wrote it down on, or you're going to have to break into their computer and find where they stupidly left it in a file that was hackable through a centralized format, like say, you know, Dropbox or something like that. That could happen. But no, you can't actually go and say, you know, I don't know what this is. It's like, yeah, the public key means that you do know what happened there. You do know all of this, say, you know, Bitcoin was transferred or this and such information was transferred and whatever encrypted, what you can see what was actually done there to a degree, but you can't see between who and you can't get into the password to be able but, to access and, and rob that from, that from that transaction. Right. But it's also who and where, because you also don't know really until unless you knew who, where it went. So like you don't right. know what the next block is or you don't know the next place that it's going to. So you don't have that, that ability who, where- the who when and we, the same, right? Yeah. Because the person is the where, yeah. right? So it, the, the fact that that's encrypted means that, yeah, I mean, if you knew that, oh, well, there was a transaction, you know, and, and you knew basically this was, I can figure out that, yes, definitely my friend, or they told me they bought a bunch of Ethereum. Like, here's an interesting story that I recently read about. There's a, it was one of the first cases in New York City that's come up, um, into the judicial system about uh, crypto robbery. So there were two men that knew each other. One made a, a, what he calls a small investment in Ethereum in 20, I want to say 11 or 12, a long time ago when it was much, much cheaper and has now subsequently become a millionaire, has a, a little over a million dollars equivalent in Ethereum, maybe two. And uh, his friend knows about it and, or his associate knows about it, who also knows, you know, they ha did some business together or whatever. They, his friend invites him out to go to lunch and says, you know, um, let's go to this place. It's here in New York City. And the guy's like, yeah, sure. Let's hop on the subway. He's like, no, hang on. Let me just um, get a car. He's like, no, let's just hop on the subway. And he's like, no, really, I want to just get a car. And he's, he keeps insisting that he's getting a car. And the guy's like, it's just two sub subway stops. And if you're a New Yorker, you know, there's no reason to get in the car and spend three or four times more than the subway's right there. A millionaire knows that. Anybody <laughs> that and it's like a ridiculous tourist thing to be like i i don't do the subway like my mother feels that way that's not <laughs> so he's like we're gonna get in the subway and he's like no hang on hang on just stand here and he keeps kind of like leading him out closer to the curb suddenly a van pulls up kidnaps the guy throws him in the ethereum owner throws him into the van the other guy's like oh my gosh my friend's been kidnapped <laughs> the guy is like um held for maybe i don't know a number of hours um, interrogated and asked, where are your private keys? Where are your private keys? And he says, I don't have them on me. And he's beat up or whatever. I don't know exactly the extent of the abuse he endured, but basically I think about 12 hours later, something like that, he was released after he had said, the private keys are in my house. Then he comes home to a burglary and his private keys have been stolen. And he lives in an apartment that has like video cameras and the other man who was trying to get him to get that car who had invited him to lunch that day was seen walking in and walking out carrying a box, a box identified by the first gentleman as the box holding his private keys. It went to jail, it went to court. I don't know what the outcome has been, but the, they're like, well, it was all in crypto, so we don't know. And it's like, no, 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 we actually know more because then you can see exactly the wallet that he had held it in. You can see on the blockchain that from that wallet, after this burglary, somebody transferred it to another wallet. And from that wallet, it transferred to three others. And you can see exactly where it went. You don't know to who because the private keys identify who, but you do know that it happened. And so there's proof now of the burglary in, in real time. There's proof of the transfer of the money out of that person's wallet in real time. And there's proof that it was distributed to three others. Now, how can you go about finding the identities of these others? I would imagine that the person who burgled this person sounds to me like it's cool, and that's why he's, he's suing him, is the person behind this. Now, allegedly, right, if it's that person, then, then that's, that's why he's in court. So he now has to prove that he didn't, he wasn't the person behind this, even though so many other evident, evidence points point to that. Now, recovering it's another story, but tracking it is extraordinarily easy because it was all done in crypto, right? It's not like he had a million dollars in cash in his home and it was just taken and now, you know, somebody could have tipped the waiter on the way out and they could have, you know, you'd never see it. This is like, we know exactly where this went, exactly to what wallets exactly when. But, and so, but the thing is that if you never reveal your private key, right? If you're right. never done, you know, and it's never found. So how do the courts, that guy's not going to volunteer it because that's He's incriminating. Not. That's true. He's not going to volunteer it. So you never know. So is the there the a repository of private keys somewhere of which it could be matched? No, 
there's not a repository of private keys to match it. It's just simply if once that private key. So I think that there's an interesting play here, and I don't know how it played out in the judicial system, but that's why it was newsworthy. Is that this is the first time that we're going to see um, the the law saying, you know, uh, we're going to subpoena your private keys. Is that yeah. possible? Is that is it? Legal? Yeah, I mean, because that's a new precedent. Can that? Because are you the only one who can verify it? Right. So, and if you say I don't have it. Um, how could it be? I mean, so there are a lot of questions about this incredible privacy that private keys hold. And now in this particular case, what exactly is going to become the legal precedent for handling issues of crime in related to? Well, and, and you can privacy. have more than one private key. Um, well, a private key that you have is for a specific wallet. That's right. So, so you can have more than one wallet, right? Right. Yeah. So you can also say, here are my private keys and not that one. But again, you're not complying with a subpoena. And if that's ever discovered, that's its own separate, you know, like charge, right? right. So it's interesting to me to see, like, how is the law going to, you know, how is regulation going to, and, and legislation going to, you know, catch up to what's now technologically possible? Because in the end, there was kidnapping, there was interrogations, so that means abuse, right? I mean, there's all kinds of that's yeah. a lot of charges against some people. And then there was burglary, breaking and entering. There was theft. And then there was this ledger on the blockchain that proves the, the true actions that were resulted from that theft. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's just that you can't see who, who executed that part. And that's where value gets assessed. So right. I can see this being such a legal tangle. Now, I think yeah. the interesting part, though, is thinking about it from like, let's say I want to stay anonymous for something, but I want to prove my ownership of something at some point. I can come forward and do that without revealing all of the other things that I've done. Well, um, yeah, I mean that transaction that went to like one specific wallet. You can you can say here's my here's here's the proof that it's mine, and I'm going to do something with it. But that once once it's known, like say the the public key for a wallet, you can watch, you can see all oh, the transactions that happened with that wallet. You can see what happened, right? That's how a smart contract works. You can right. go and say this this money was transferred to this to this actual address to this to this location, and you can you can see exactly all the things that have happened in that location. So when somebody say, you know, used to raise money with an ICO, I want to say used to because it, it's really less common now in the mm -hmm. States. But you know, when people would do that, you could you could literally see you could watch and be like, yep, they've done that. And you could you could watch what their true fundraising was, unlike say on Kickstarter, where they just say, now we've got a thing and they've got like a news feed, which is an interesting, it's kind of a similar thing, but it doesn't show you the actual money went in. It just says a third, a, a centralized party Kickstarter tells you, we promise Scouts Honor that money went there. Um, yeah. Maybe a lot of people could have made donations and then reversed them later through PayPal or said, I'm going to call out fraud on my visa, blah, blah, blah. But you'd never know those particular things because you wouldn't see the actual transaction. Now, again, I think we're coming up to the same issue that comes up with um, private keys themselves, which is an interface issue. And that's with all new technology. Are we really going to need to know all of those transactions so deeply as average consumers to get this to scale, right? For this to become massively adopted technology? Or is it really, really, it's just like a fancier way to do the same thing people have already seen on the front end, which is just like the Kickstarter thing. No, nope, people just, here's, here it is, the news feed of like all the cool people that put their money into that project or all the transactions that happened at this place. And yes, if you're really a nerd, you might jump in and be like, I'm going to check the blockchain and see if that's real. But ultimately, <laughs> the interface issue has already been solved. We tell you what happened. Here's how much money we raised. Here's how much money is there. Here's how it's going to be used. Here's our splash video about what we're going to do with it. All of those things have not been changed by blockchain. Right. Well, and, and this is the thought that goes through my mind, though, is that like the complication of having, I mean, it makes sense to have multiple wallets. Like I could see myself saying, I want a wallet that is going to secure my, my patents and my IP and my ownership of my, of my inventions and my products. Okay. I could yeah. see that as, you know, as a corporation, not just as a, a human. Right. Yep. Yeah. And then I'm going to have, oh, and I'm going to have a different wallet that's for daily transactions and my day-to-day -day stuff because I don't really care. If someone ever asked me, I'd turn that one over in a minute and go, yeah, you can see how many Starbucks I bought last week, you know, whatever that would be in the future, right? So you can see that happening. And, and, you know, this is, I mean, you know, this is a wealth building strategy, right? right? To have multiple accounts in multiple banks at, you know, multiple countries right now. Right. Like I just was encouraged to open an, uh, uh, to spin off my podetized platform in a corporation in Belize. Right. I was right. just encouraged to do that. And so I was like, 
well, I, it's going to be time this year to figure that out. So maybe I will consider that good idea. Right. But most your average person doesn't know that. And I think that's where we're starting to get into this issue of like, I think I want to get into cryptocurrency. I'd like to get a wallet, <laughs> but you know, we have we thought it all the way through what it means to actually have a wallet. It's not like, right. Oh, I just got a credit card. Right. It's not at all. It's not at all. And uh, a debit card technically would be a little more accurate because it's not right. credit. Right. Right. Um, a debit card or whatever. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, and that's again, like the, the interface issue, because if you take away the complicated long string of numbers and letters that makes up a private key, which is so encrypted and you say, and oh, it's really complicated. Let's like back away from that, do something else. Um, but how about we'll just like, uh, I mean, well, what have we got so far? We used to have passwords for everything, typed out passwords. Then we got, you know, like on an iPhone, that's the thumbprint. Then it became the face. So the eyes, we do the eyes, eyes on in the airport, and you so know that's some, do something else. Somebody might be the like someone's might make the app that says we'll hold all your keys and link it to your iris. Now that would be pretty attractive as an interface. But then here's the problem. So you know that occurred to me when I was doing an interview about Walla and Dalla. Right. And uh -huh. so they were talking about, um, so she was talking about, um, and this is uh, Trisha. Um, I forgot Trisha's last name. I'm blanking on it. Uh, Trisha Martinez. That's right. her last name. Yeah. Trisha Martinez. And so, um, but Trisha was talking to me about it. And so they, they're there in Africa and they're in this country and they've got, uh, grocery stores where they can redeem the, 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 yep. the Crypto. aid. It's yeah. The currency is in a form of aid. They can redeem the aid for the food right there. But what happens if you're sick and your family needs it to eat and your iris is the one that they rely on because your key is securing that? Like, right. is there a way, you know, there's, it, it, that's where well, we start to get in legacy complications of where well, we need to really assign power to someone, right? Temporarily. That's been, that's been somewhat addressed in things like multi-sig wallets. Multi-sig wallets already exist. They're multi-signature wallets, meaning that um, you put three people on a, on a wallet and it takes two out of three to sign. So huh. then you can, so you can, you can send just, two of your kids. <laughs> right. So you can distribute the, the access so that you know, like a consortium of two of us can always make this transaction. Right. And so if one person dies, we're still covered. That's really important. But so like, say for example, you know, you have, there's um, a husband with lots, with a lot of, of, of with a wallet and a lot of um, crypto in it. And he wants to put his wife on it, but he also wants to put his, his daughter on it so that if he ever dies in a plane crash, the two of them can access their, their family's wealth and vice versa. If any one of them goes, they can't access it alone, but they can together. And so you can also make it a five SIG or a, a seven SIG, whatever. So there's some, you know, odd majority that can access this. And so you can actually be creating governance structures around that. So we already have lots of, you know, when, when you look at automating things with smart contracts, we can see like straight decision trees already technologically just acted out once somebody hits go and they have, and they, they input a certain piece of data that like goes down that decision tree. The decision tree to release say a cryptocurrency from a wallet would go down the decision tree in a multi-sig wallet with two people out of three or three out of five or, you know, whatever four out of seven or whatever. So that also could mean that somewhere, think about like the way operating systems are, I'm sorry, um, operating agreements work for companies where it's like, we are going to distribute the authority among this board and the majority of the board will be making such and such and such decisions with their, you know, voting shares. Right. Right. Which makes it like much harder to pierce the corporate veil because you've got ledger tracking of all of your votes and decisions and all of those things going on, which is so, I, you know, I see it from a corporate standpoint. I see it as ideal. I think right now, though, the other complication is, is that wallet issuance, like, do we trust how wallets are being issued and, and, you know, and, or is that in control of, of, you know, a few companies, too few companies right now. And, and I think that, you know, that, that we keep hitting onto logistical problems and, and sort of like, is this actually trustworthy in the process? And that's what you and I are, are constantly looking at here is like, where is it being resolved and how is that working? And how can we explain that to ourselves and to our community? Well, and I think in terms of trustworthy, we, it's pretty clear that there wouldn't be this buzz around this mysterious technology unless it was absolutely revolutionary and revolutionary in terms of what it can do for, 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 for pushing forward trust and autonomy and privacy in a, a system that has not had that to the same degree before. So it is revolutionary. How we do it, I can't help it. It's like, I, I just am always going to be beating the interface drum. 
because you know it's the person who can make it simple and elegant and sexy and easy that will do well in the marketplace no matter what they're bringing to market but when we're talking about complicated you know very revolutionary technology that's very relevant to the average consumer and difficult to understand and utilize the person who can make that really easy to, to just grab hold of without obscuring the details that, because the devil's in those details without obscuring the risk or the non-risk associated with those actions i think they're going to win you know it's yeah. still an interface issue the person who's got the most the most useful app or dap is going to be dominating the crypto market because they're going to be in everyone's hand and everyone's going to use it because they finally get it and they like it. Yeah. You know, that it's really interesting because that goes back to, you know, our third episode that we did with Eric Tippett's and Nazgo, because I mean, in a way that's what they're doing is they're making this super simple one-stop place for a business to go and put themselves on the block com, give themselves, get a wallet, uh, do what's necessary to execute a smart contract. And it's just really easy and simple to do that. That's why they're bullish on that. So I think, you know, when we're talking about that, that that's the comp competitive space right there, you're absolutely right that this is the the, the place that companies are, com are are competing against but i yeah. think we still have an education on like a little bit of the concept of wallet and you know we're not still talking our language of like debit card account number routing number right you know right you have to still bring that together and this is where i see a lot of companies falling apart who are in this world we're in our no we're in our lingo yeah. and we're not bringing it out and i know that you're all about that because that's what your book is about exactly so. <laughs> exactly and that's the thing i'm like maybe i think we should just ditch the idea the word crypto at all because people you know what people average consumers ask me at conferences where they're like i've never been to a blockchain conference actually this happened at the conference that i met you at tracy that's right <laughs> i got off stage and this lovely old woman old i would say older <laughs> but very new, someone who I'm sure had trouble programming the VCR. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> she was like, well, crypto, I mean, it makes me think of kryptonite that killed, that, that would all, almost killed Superman. Or is it crypto, <laughs> like from the crypt, like tales from the crypt, like it's dead? And I was like, we've got to get away from that word. We've got to get away. <laughs> you know what? It reminds me, and this is why this is why I'm here, right? This is why I chose to do a podcast on blockchain with you, <laughs> because this is exactly where I was sitting when we were talking about 3D printing five yeah. years ago. And I was like, can you stop talking about it like, you know, slicing and start talking about the fact that like nobody cares. It's just getting prepared for the printer. Like, right. why can't right. we just talk about it like that? We got to talk about it in lingo. Like, oh, we're fancy. Oh. We're slicing stuff. Like, oh, oh please just drop it. it. No one just cares. Just drop it. Just drop <laughs> it and get it ready. That's yeah. why I'm like, this is just digital money. It's just digital money. Okay. Yeah. Like, so I'm at a conference right now with one of my favorite people on earth, Wendy Lipton Dibner. It's called Focus on Impact. This, is, this conference is called Move People to Action, but her, my book that I, her book, her book is Focus on Impact, which is a great book if you're building a business. It's like oh, a really cool. great one. And, um, and I've reviewed it in my columns. So like I've known her a long time um, and since I read it and was fascinated by it. But she, one of the things she says here is like, stop telling people I'm going to transform your life and like all of this stuff because right? entrepreneurs like that. But real people go, oh God, not again. Like, no, and so, yeah, no. it's just, right. And they're like, I don't want to hear that stuff. But what they want to hear is, they want to be, they want words that they see that are six year old. And it's not because you're belittling them, it's because you're respecting their time and you're going straight for something that everybody understands. You know, here's the other thing. I've actually, when people say talk to me like I'm five, I'm like, well, yes and no. How about this? Everyone wants to sound and feel smart. You know, I've heard people say, like, um, learning is humiliating. Because if you stay in your zone of like what you already know, you always feel like, you know what's going on. Like you're in charge. I don't like comfort zone. I'm, I'm not yeah. comfortable in my comfort zone. So I'm not one of those people, but I get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but you're also an entrepreneur. So we have to remember <laughs> so many people are really seeking comfort of, of the familiar. And, and so if you can't make it familiar, use familiar words, find out their words and say it back to them in their words. I talk about tokenizing real estate and I'm like, eh, tokenize. How about, no, I do formalized fractional ownership. It's tech enabled fractionalized ownership. It's tech enabled fractional investment. It's, you know, and then people say, is it like a REIT? And I'm like, sure. I always say yes to the analogy someone's trying to make because they're saying, I have a comfort zone. It's called this thing. It's, does it fit in the domain? And I always say it fits. It fits with a little twist. So when you're like, oh, routing number and account number, I'm like, yes, with a little twist. twist right. And because 
then you get to keep people comfortable. So I think the talk to them like they're five, no, talk to them like they're 45 because everybody wants to feel smart. And you, if you can communicate well, you can get people to con get a new concept without feeling like they had to stretch and get uncomfortable to get there. If you right. can that, and that's where I say it's not language because I have to write my column like, you know, you write to a fourth grader is like what they always say. But I have to tell you, I have a fourth grader and she's smarter than most people I know. So <laughs> it's not about the language that you're like a true mother. <laughs> yeah, she's, I mean, she's, she's super intuitive and she's really sharp. But, you know, you've got that. It's not the language that you use. It is, as you're saying, it's the familiarity of what they've known and learned about up to that point. Yeah. And when we're in our, when we're in our bubble, of tech, we know a whole lot more that goes a whole lot deeper. Yep. And, you know, this whole conversation was actually started. And the reason we decided to do this podcast was I was reading the book, um, Life After Google. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And so, yeah, which I have to tell you, like I was reading it and I was, I'm going to look up the author's name because I can't remember how I, it's George Gilder and, um, and Life After Google. And, and he's like, so he's a tech writer who writes in the industry. So he's been okay. writing about the whole like dot com all the way till now, right? You know what? I'm so sorry. Hang on, I have an emergency. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, one sec. So the whole thing that spawned this conversation was the fact that I was reading this book, Life After Google by George Gilder. And he has been covering, he's like a tech writer and he's been covering the sort of people in the industry and, and <laughs> not just blockchain, he's been covering it since like the inception of oh my comms, gosh. right? That's and so, great. yeah, but he's like, he's like a frat boy. Like I can't explain it any other way. He's like, <laughs> he like knows who they went to college with and, and it's all men in the book. Like right. I haven't hit on a woman yet. Like there's not a story yet. It's all about the men who've invented Google and who did this and you know, Microsoft that and HP this and who went to Harvard and did that right. or who, who dropped out of Harvard, who was a Peter Thiel fellow. Like, like that's all the thing is it's all about that. And he tells these stories and he paints a really interesting picture. Like I, I the writing's really good. But it, it's one of these things where, like, I'm looking at it going, like, do I need to know this? Do I even care? Like, who wrote the code for this? That now is this value? Like, like, is this valuable to me? And instead, yeah. it's just like, my head hurts, and I can't pronounce any of these guys' names. And I'm like, you know, and I, is this the same guy from last time? Like, it's very confusing. And so, but at the end of the time, I'm like, I really want to hear about what the life after Google is going to look like. Yeah, instead of like the bitter fight over who invented Bitcoin. <laughs> I know the bitter fight of who invented Bitcoin is not going to be interesting to anybody but the nerds. Again, but the like, nerds, right? Not... I was like, I, I do want to, I think your normal person wants to read a book about what life after Google looks like. A business person wants to read that. But do we want all of this? So, right, exactly. Yeah. So I anyway- <laughs> and that's just how this got started. And I thought we'd, you know, kind of cover it. And I think we really, I, I think, you know, I think I know a lot more about how to explain wallets and, and private keys and public keys now. And I, I'm really glad we had this conversation. I hope this helped others. Well, I hope that it, uh, we didn't just, I hope I didn't throw in the, um, the court case as the first <laughs> example of how private keys come into play. Cause I don't, I really want to get away from that. That might be a bad one. Crime, <laughs> you know, dark web, like uh, human trafficking stuff. Like let's just I, digital money. There was you know a bad guy that did a bad thing, but private keys played a role. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, well, you know, thanks so much, Monica, for helping me out here and sort of, sure. uh, sort of like airing this while we do it. I think that's the fun way that we're going to be able to continue to make this podcast interesting for people. And yeah. if you guys have, have anything out there that you would like us to explain you would like us to research you'd like us to discuss and debate yes. you'd like us, us to get know. an expert for you gotta let us know so you yeah. can find us at newtrusteconomy.com on social media at newtrusteconomy and we're everywhere yeah. we're, we're syndicated now everywhere so oh you can also listen find us all over the place it's but crazy we really appreciate right now if you would rate and review us that would yes, really help please. us get moving rate and review but i mean really only rate and review if you feel great about it if you don't eh, maybe just skip reading and reviewing okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you can leave us a good review like if you can't say something nice that's what exactly. my mother would say <laughs> ask no. check in with your inner mom and just be that's like right. if you're not saying something nice do no. i want to troll them please don't troll us that's right. all i am <laughs> but we would re we really appreciate it. So because uh, it'll help us keep the show moving. So sure. thank you all so much. And until next time, this has been Tracy and Monica. Thanks, you guys. Bye bye.